Kallid kuulajad ja vaatajad, täna on meil eriline külaline Ameerikast Jarun Brook, kes on Ayn Rand instituudi juht, autor ja ütleme niimoodi, et kapitalismi eestkõnale ja. Hello Jarun. Hi. Really nice to have you here in Estonia. Nice to be here. What is the kind of main uh, thing that pops in your mind when you think about Estonia? <laughs> Uh, I think I think the things that I've heard that's most interesting about Estonia, and this is a while back, is that like you're all electronic. There's there's no all paper, digital. All digital. Um, you know, so insurance and driver's license and all that stuff is uh, is digital, and uh, so so that's kind of a cool aspect of uh, what I think of as Estonia. Other than that, you know, a small country bordering Russia uh, that Russia would like love to love to you know Brat. get its hands on. <laughs> Uh, and uh, not far from where my family originally is from, which is uh, uh, probably northern Di- Lithuania. That's awesome. Is there any any kind of bad idea that comes to mind when you when you think about Estonia? Not really. I mean, I, I don't have that much experience with Estonia, so I haven't developed any bad ideas yet about it. Probably from the ex-Soviet Union countries, Estonia is the more the most kind of pro-free market and capitalist. Do you think that's true? It's hard to tell. I mean, uh, uh, I think the Czech Republic has lower taxes. Uh, I think Georgia, at least for a while, uh, had a free economy. Uh, and I don't know, uh, you know, how Estonia ranks. I mean, it would be interesting to look at all the the, the um, post-Soviet countries and look uh, rank them based on uh, economic freedom. But Estonia certainly has the reputation of being uh, high on the list. We love startups, companies, entrepreneurs. That's great. <laughs> that's, that's that's great. really awesome because yeah. this is this is driving our innovation and making people people happy. Uh, one of the one of the um, things about Ayn Rand uh, that usually like average people get pissed off is is about the happiness, the selfishness, the the kind of individual responsibility. Um, yeah, get, getting pissed off at happiness makes a lot of sense. Yeah, uh, why why do you think there's so much people that are actually not willing to to put time into their happiness and pursue their dreams? They rather be uh, in a kind of negative echo chamber with with all the destructive ideas. Well, I think I think it's a number of things. One is, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people are lazy. Happiness requires effort, uh, and and taking care of yourself requires real uh, energy. It requires actually thinking about it. It requires engagement. So so there's real effort and energy required. I think the second is that it goes against all of our teachings. Everything we're taught from our priests to our family to our philosophers. Uh, you know, we are taught that to be happy is to be selfish. Selfishness we're taught is bad. Uh, a moral responsibility, a primary ethical responsibility is to other people. Um, and the most noble thing you can do is to be selfless. Uh, you you know, you, you become a saint or you become a good person by sacrificing, by giving up your time. And, and that is kind of baked in primarily through Christianity. And, and, but even secular people, while they have maybe abandoned the mysticism of Christianity, they hold on to this moral code uh, as uh, you know because that is all they know and they have been taught that the alternative the only alternative to it is a kind of uh, uh, nastiness that is if you're not going to sacrifice if you're not going to be selfless you're going to be quote selfish which means to them you're going to lie and steal and cheat and exploit other people and just be a horrible human being and between those choices they don't want to be a horrible human being so they they give up on life in a sense and and they'd rather do that and and it's it's hard for them to think that there's a third alternative and that is to be self-interested in a kind of a rational sense uh to be uh to be somebody who cares about one's own well-being and that doesn't mean exploiting other people quite the contrary it means trading it means uh, creating win-win relationships with other people but that's that requires effort and it's hard and it's it's a new philosophy it's a new set of ideas Look, for 2,000 years, since Aristotle, 2,500, 3,000 years, nobody has thought of morality as egoistic, as pro self-interest, other than Ayn Rand. Hmm. So it, it turns out it's quite an, quite an achievement to think in those terms, particularly at the back, with the background of Christianity. 
Um, so it's going to take a while for those ideas to filter through. So it's actually m more moral to be egoistic in that sense. Well, I, I, I would say the only moral thing to do is to be egoistic because the, the morality is for what? What's the purpose of morality? Morality is for the purpose of living a good life. Who will live a good life? You, right? So it's centered in you. This is Aristotle's whole view of morality is it's a set of principles to help you achieve a flourishing life, to help you achieve success in life. And that's Rand's view. It's, it's how do human beings survive? How do human beings thrive? How do we achieve great things? Well, how do I survive? How do I thrive? So it, 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 the beneficiary of your action should be you. That means personal responsibility. That means responsibility over your life and over your actions and over your thoughts. Uh, and, and that is morality. So uh, the idea of self-sacrifice, the idea of, of being selfless is in that sense it's, it's, it's anti-morality. It doesn't make any sense. It's, it's a morality of death. It's, a, it's an anti-life uh, morality, which is kind of a contradiction in terms because the whole point of morality is to teach human beings how to live. Interesting. I, I think it's, it's somehow correlating with a, with a thing from that the um, people are too much tied to their bodies and when you are pr producing always the stress and the stress hormones it's just like sinking and you and you you cannot get out so basically uh the more the more you are influenced by your body hormones the the the, the more there is the less the it's a chance that you can get out so basically uh the the more ideas you are able to process the less you are attached to your body processes because your body automatically wants you to to basically feel the stress all the time and be destructive and when you have uh, some some cheat meal you want to go for 10 cheat meals and so on so you're programmed for destruction inside your body so i don't think you're programmed for destruction inside your body i think again bad ideas lead to bad body processes so i think there's a mind body integration but and self control is hard <laughs> yeah but 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 if we're taught not to have self control but also if you're taught to follow your emotions or if you're taught that reason and rationality are beyond you they're not you're not capable of them uh, if you're taught that uh, your body is sinful right then all of that creates conflict and creates problems but if you're taught the harmony of body and mind if you're taught that pleasure is good, uh, if you're taught that reason is what guides you towards proper pleasure, towards long-term satisfaction and towards long-term happiness, then it's far easier to skip the, the, the silly temptations of the moment and to structure everything in terms of how of your long-term happiness. And you're not doing it in the name of anti-pleasure, in the name of you know, something above and beyond the body, some some mystical spirit. You're doing it because this is the best thing for your body and your mind. Uh, so it's all about the ideas we, we have. It's all about the habits we pick up as children, which are guided by our parents' ideas. So it's, it's, it's very much uh, our, our bodies are guided by the set of ideas we have. And when we have conflicts in our mind, that manifests itself in stress right. because we have conflicts uh, then it manifests in conflicts in our body is this set of worldview is this for like minority of people and it will never be mainstream we have to always struggle to get the idea of reason out there i don't think so i think it can be a mainstream idea at least uh, in a in a in a certain sense that is not everybody's going to be a philosopher not but everybody's going to dig deep into this but if it becomes the norm in society, if the intellectuals hold these ideas and convey them to the public and, and, and people start doing them because that's kind of the norm, then I think they're, they're self-reinforcing. And then I think it, 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 it's, 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 you know, it becomes a, a second nature. So I, I, I think that the fight really is, the battle really is to capture the intellectuals mm. or really to replace the intellectuals. It's to create a next generation of intellectuals so that what people hear are these positive messages about their self-worth, their positive messages about the effort required and the, and the reward that the effort uh, achieves. So if we can capture the intellectual high ground 
if we can replace the common intellectuals, then I think it's easy then uh, to, uh, you know, to get the rest of the people on board with these ideas. It's like managing well your finances, being the good health, basically the same thing as with ideas, right? Yes, and, and it's funny because people do listen to podcasts about how to manage their health and how to manage their finances, uh, but that is all on a background in which says, you know, don't take care of yourself too much, don't be too self-interested, You know, remember, you should feel guilty about your success right. because you're not being Mother Teresa. You're not going out into Africa and, and, and saving, uh, saving poor people. So uh, it, it's this, th there's this constant conflict inside of people's minds, there's, which generates guilt, which I think is part of what creates these uh, disharmony within the body, the stress that, that relates to, on the one hand, yeah, I have this feeling I have to take care of my finances, I have to do self-help, I have to learn how to meditate, meditate, whatever. But on the other hand, I feel guilty because I'm taking care of myself and I'm supposed to do these other things. And that creates all kind of cognitive dissonance. Right, that's interesting. But it's it's kind of always the the, um, the struggle uh, with with your, these destructive forces, but it's true that they are start, they're getting started in your ideas and then they're extrapolated to the body. Yeah, the destructive forces are self-imposed. There's nothing natural about them. We're not born in, in, for destruction. Quite the contrary, we're born for growth, we're born for And that's for interesting, is because we have so much influence from probably Christianity that there was so much indoctrinating these ideas that you are destructive in your core and so on and so on. So yeah, we, original sin, uh, original sin is what? It's, 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 it, it, to some extent, original sin is sex, right? It's, it's the very pleasure that is sex, it's, the, it's a celebration that is sex. So, so, so much of our natural inclinations, we view as negative, we view as sinful, we view as kind of dirty, and, and, and that creates real internal conflict. Uh, instead of viewing human beings as, you know, we're fundamentally, we're fundamentally pro-life, pro-growth, pro-progress, sex is a beautiful, amazing thing, and if, if, if we're raised that way, if we grow up that way, if we abandon original sin, and the idea that somehow a baby is sinful, there's something bad about just human life, then I think we can grow up w with much more of an integrated approach to life, with ideas integrated uh, with our body and our soul. And as a consequence, be psychologically and, and uh, spiritually much healthier. Right. Speaking of the ideas, um, I mean, in, in our society here, even in Estonia, I think I consume 90% of the content that is coming from the US. So basically all the podcasts, Navy SEALs and everything. Yeah. But um, I try to choose the constructive content, but there is so much things that are coming from, from, from uh, the West that is uh, so um, crappy in terms yeah. of the, the gender and all these ideologies. Um, so what's, what's going on on, the, on this um, battle of ideas? Uh, why these ideas are appearing? What's, what's going to happen to them? Because we can see that uh, these are directly transported even like to the smaller countries like Estonia, and you, you have all the ideologies pretty active here as well. Yes, I mean, uh, it, it, once they get a root in the United States, they tend to spread all over the world. And the reason is that, you know, uh, our, our modern ideologies are dead. There are no modern ideologies, you know, kind of, we have been cruising, if you will, on the ideas of the Enlightenment for a long, long time. We have science because of the Enlightenment, we have, because of the rediscovery of reason, and because of the secularization of society. And yet, in the United States and in, in the West, those ideas of the Enlightenment have slowly been abandoned. The idea of reason has been undermined. We have postmodernism, we have subjectivism, we have emotionalism, we have uh, ideas that basically say uh, that there is no objective reality, that there is no objective truth. And, and these ideas that came out, look, they've been developing for a long time. The anti-Enlightenment started immediately. It started with Rousseau and with Kant, right. Hegel, Schopenhauer, Marx, Nietzsche. I mean, a whole line. And then you get the postmodernists, and then you get the, and and all of that leads to a fragmentation of uh, a fragmentation of ideas, um, no cohesive integration of ideas, and it it it, it leads to uh, a distrust of um, of reality, a distrust of our own capacity to reason a distrust of truth, so we now live in a so-called post-truth era. 
it's a complete disintegration of human knowledge. And that leads to crappy ideas, all kinds of crappy ideas. There's, there's no theme to the crappy ideas except that they're crappy and that they're disintegrated, they're non-universal. And, and you know, so what you get is this intersectionality type thing where, where people now compete. They take this uh, morality that says that the needy, uh, out of Christianity really, that, that the needy are virtuous, that need is a claim against everybody else, that people should be selfless and sh they should devote their lives to helping the needy. And then they take that and they create hierarchies of need. Hmm. And, and so if you're, if you're a minority, you need more than if you're a white male. And if you're trans and a minority and da, 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 all the, all the, all the combinations, kind of yeah. combinations of neediness, that gives you the ultimate. But it's all based on Christ a combination of Christianity with postmodernism, mm. a complete negation of human reason. And, you know, will critical race theory survive in, in some form? Most of it, it, everybody can see as crap, will it be abandoned? But what will replace it? More crap a different variation of crap because the fundamental is unless we're willing to go in a sense to rediscover the 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 idea of one reality of objective reality reason as our means of knowing that reality uh, logic is our means of discovering truth real truth and the existence of truth and then the fact that we're not identified by our needs and our our weaknesses and our uh, failings but that each one of us is an individual, that, but there are certain universal principles that guide us all, certain moral universal principles, certain epistemological universal principles. That's what has to be rediscovered, kind of the ideas of the Enlightenment, but better. And I think Ayn Rand takes the Enlightenment and makes it better. She, she fills in all the gaps, all the philosophical backs, gaps and the holes. And that's what needs to be kind of discovered, rediscovered, and, and only when we abandon the kind of uh, German romantic philosophies, we abandon kind of the postmodernism, the subjectivism, the moral and epistemological subjectivism, can we get back on a path uh, towards, you know, reinvigorating our ideas and reinvigorating philosophy and reinvigorating science and, and, and getting back to a, 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 a pro-life a, a pro path. Right. Yeah, it's it's sometimes it gets absurd in that sense that even uh, like here, uh, you you have people who are talking about the critical race theory, even though our society, our history is is really off from all these topics. But people engage to them, and they they kind of think of uh, these problems as their own, even though they don't have any connection with that. But it but it fits because you know Estonia is part of a Christian tradition right. that says that you have original sin. Original sin transmutes constantly what that constitutes, and now original sin is being white. It's being European. It's, uh, you know, you're, you're inherently, uh, you know, an oppressor. You're inherently, quote, privileged. You're inherently bad because you happen to have a certain color skin. It, you know, and, and this we used to call this racism, uh, identifying somebody based on the color of their skin and, and associating, and, and it is, it's, it's basically a new form of racism. And um, it, it's, it's, it, it truly is horrific, but this is kind of the, the fragmentation and the uh, anti-reason. I mean, uh, how can you be against racism and then uh, accuse all white people of X or, or, or anything else? It's, it's, it's completely illogical, irrational, a negation of reason. And look, it comes from a background that there really was racism, that there really is racism today. So it's not out of nowhere, it's not in a void, um, but it is a, a, a another mutation of the Christian idea of original sin, the Christian idea of your moral commitment to selflessness, so you're not part of a group. What identifies you is not your moral characteristics as an hu individual human being. What identifies you is a membership in a particular group. You're blonde and you're white, therefore you must be an oppressor, you must be part of a majority. <laughs> and nobody cares about who you are as an individual. You're identified as those parameters. But again, that's all the same philosophy we've been dealing with since the end of the Enlightenment, hashed over, mutated into its various uh, forms. ugly yeah. forms. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, that's interesting. But it, it feels like we're just uh, in a specific phase of the history where we'll, we will get over these ideas and come with the new ones. Well, and the, the question is, ones. will the new ones be better or will they be worse? <laughs> uh, and it seems like the trend is towards worse ideas, not better ideas. There was a sense in 1991 when the Soviet Union fell apart that old, that bad ideas were dead, right? And, and that, that socialism was dead, but generally with socialism died a lot of the bad ideas associated with socialism. And it turns out, no, that, that unless we're willing to advocate for new good ideas, unless we're willing to educate people about good ideas and, and their importance and their importance to the individual, unless we're willing to go beyond pol politics and really delve into philosophy and epistemology and morality and, uh, and, and the nature of human beings, uh, we have to teach the world what the alternative is. It's not just going to happen automatically because what tends to happen is the Soviet Union falls. Yes, everybody's against socialism for a while, but then there's no alternative. There are no other ideas to come in. There's no new ideas that introduce. Because you have to work on this. <laughs> because you have to work on this, and, 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 and people have to adopt those new ideas, and they have to be intellectuals to teach these new ideas. And so, so people start looking for alternatives to socialism, and they, f and, and they don't reject the foundation. They don't reject the, 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 the collectivism, the, the anti-individualism. They don't, they don't reject the anti-reason ideas of communism so they adopt some other form of collectivism some other form of anti-reason and that's what we've seen over the last 30 years right communism morphing into now you know critical race theory or, or tribalism or fascism or religionism or whatever but other forms of the same thing uh just rehash you know hashed and and constructed differently is, is government involved much in, in the spreading all these ideas and, and being the cause of, of uh, basically having involvement in all parts of life, telling uh, basically people what to do, how to think? Because usually when you see the, the spread of the bad ideas, you see that they're not coming from, from private capital or, or kind of, uh, yeah, uh, private Although sources. Arguably, arguably they are, right? Arguably a lot of our tech companies are, just, are, are, are oh, furthering right. these <laughs> ideas. So, so I don't think it's purely government, but certainly government has a huge role to play here. And, and the biggest part of that role is the fact that government controls education, mm. right? Most of our educational institutions are run by government, they're government schools. And even private schools are often uh, guided through in the curriculum uh, through a department of education and, and education curriculum and I think that undermines I think even in the best schools in Estonia supposedly has very good schools Finland supposedly has the best schools in the world but my guess is they could be so much better and the education in them could be so much better and my guess is that in these schools maybe they teach math and science pretty well but what they don't teach is these is these other ideas and particularly the ideas of personal responsibility the ideas of, of taking responsibility over your life over your mind over your everything that's involved they don't teach you how to prop while well, they teach you math and science they don't teach you how to properly reason about life and about the world so so i think the biggest way in which government influences is through education and the second biggest is that government in, encourages us not to be s s uh, independent it it uh, facilitates Rely on me. Yeah. yeah it facilitates this dependence it it says don't worry be happy you know don't be happy we'll provide you we'll solve all your problems it encourages laziness it encourages unthinking and then when you get the latest fad ideological fad government seems to embrace it in the united states certainly on the left with the democratic party they embrace it they try to codify it into law they try to codify it into particular behaviors uh, you know, I think a lot of what's happening today around race is a consequence of the laws that were passed uh, during the civil rights era, uh, things like affirmative action and things like that, that, that kind of created a whole culture that was looking for, uh, you know, that looks at race and emphasizes race and focuses on race and, and makes a big deal out of race in the name of doing away with racism. And, what, and the actual result of it is that it's actually embraced racism and made racism worse. So I think government does make these things worse by institutionalizing them and turning them into kind of governing habits. Interesting. Um, I want to I want to talk a bit about the uh, Ukraine in in the sense that um, there there's a one guy who is uh, whose name is Alexei Aristovich, and he is. Uh, 
advisory to the president office and what he's saying now is basically after the ukraine will win uh there will be um the new set of ideas spread from ukraine since they have fight for freedom to the Europe and Europe ideas will be replaced uh, by the new ones that will come from from these territories because people have been kind of uh, setting up a, a, a new life with the, the, the new wo worldview and so on. Do you, do you believe that something can can come from there? I mean, I think I think if Ukraine wins, good will happen. Uh, but I don't think uh, Ukraine winning is going to challenge the fundamental ideas that dominate Europe. Because he says that the, the European ideas are rotten and it's it's kind of... Uh... I agree, but what are the ideas coming out of Ukraine? So Ukraine uh, believes in freedom, but what does freedom mean right now? It means not being ruled by Russians, right? But does that mean not being ruled by Ukrainians? That is, uh, are Ukrainians willing, once they defeat the Russians, are they willing to establish real freedom in Ukraine? Ukraine wasn't the freest country before Hmm. the war. Uh, it was incredibly corrupt. The government did a lot of things it shouldn't have done. The government was involved in a lot of life. The government was involved in a lot of industry. It, it, it wouldn't privatize. It, it held a lot of land. It held a lot of industries. It held a lot of natural resources. When the war is over, is the government suddenly going to become capitalist and want to, want to sell everything and, and really challenge Europe? So maybe what Europe will learn from this is that appeasement is evil, at least in the short run. But you think they would have learned that from uh, World War II, right? So it's not clear to me that they actually learned the lessons and for how long, if they do learn for how long. Uh, so I think, I think that they will learn the lesson with regard to Russia. They will learn the lesson maybe about appeasement. Maybe they'll interpret that in a positive way in terms of how to deal with China. Maybe there'll be some shakeup, but the fundamental ideas behind this, the fundamental political ideas, the fundamental ideas behind the welfare state, the fundamental ideas behind our mixed economies with heavy regulations and so on, I don't see how, uh, I don't see intellectuals in Ukraine uh, advocating for something very different and, and, uh, and challenging the West's uh, ideas about the welfare state and about the mixed economy. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there are better thinkers in Ukraine, and, and we'll discover that. Certainly, they're courageous. Certainly, they're willing to fight. Uh, that's uh, an improvement, and you're already seeing certain ideas in Europe shaken up a little bit. Germany announcing that they will increase their defense budget, although we'll see if they actually do it, right? right. Talking about it and doing it are two separate things. Um, but I don't see coming out of Ukraine a new set of intellectuals with real fresh ideas about a new role of government and a shrinking of the role of the state and individual freedom. Uh, again, they're fighting for their country's freedom, which is different than they're fighting for individual freedom. Right, probably maybe his idea is, is that there will be certain refreshment because they couldn't uh, do so much when the all the government was corrupt. So there's a new page where they can probably start. We, I hope so. I hope, I hope so. I think there's always been a lot of potential in Ukraine. They, they seem to have, um, you know, they have a memory of the Soviet Union. They have a memory of communism. They have a memory now of corruption, and and kind of what that leads to. Uh, they know how evil Putin is. They've just fought a war against Putin. Does that ultimately lead them to establishing a better government, a more rational government, uh, and or? You know, one of the things that could happen is that at the end of the war, they will look to the West for money. They will look to the West to rebuild. Mm. And uh, with that, with all the money they get from Germany and the United States and other places, there will be a lot of strings attached. And those strings will maybe that will reduce corruption in Ukraine, but they will also try to make Ukraine into another, just another European country. And uh, so I'm not sure which direction the influence will flow. Um, uh, European ideas are very powerful. Uh, the European Union is very uh, is very dominant. Ukraine wants to be a member, right? They've already applied right. for for membership. If they become a member of the European Union, they become a member of this regulatory, you know, uh, somewhat authoritarian kind of economic mm -hmm. system. It will do them good because they come from such a bad place in terms of corruption but it will reduce their ability to impact the rest of Europe.
Right. So to some extent, it's already impacted Europe because it's woken Europe up to the fact that there's still evil in the world and there's still really bad players in the world. But whether it wakes it up beyond that is hard to tell. I usually ask my guests who were born during the Soviet times uh, the, about the difference between the lifestyle uh, back then and today. And all of them say that during the time when they were going uh, be raised as a kids and go to the, the university and have a job the people were more friendly the life was more meaningful and they are struggling today to to find the same values um, so w what what do you think or uh, even though uh, they were under this regime but they're still nostalgic about the the human relationship and all this stuff that sounds bizarre to me <laughs> okay completely insane friendly friendly when your neighbor might be what might be uh, uh you know reporting you to the kgb uh friendly when the state is all powerful and looking over your shoulder and monitoring what you do and what you say and what you think i don't know if you've ever seen the movie the lives of others it's an excellent movie about about life in eastern germany Uh, during during communism, it's anything but friendly. Everybody is your enemy. Everybody could call you in. I, I think people are delusional. Uh, they have false memories. They 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 take the stress that they feel today, and they and they you know when we're children, everything seems wonderful and you know so. But they they, they don't they they don't project it back as adults. They don't think about what life was really like. They, what their parents will really go through, and older people. You know, that's all they knew. So, yes, I think it's completely delusional. Hmm. I think it's completely wrong. Um, I have no doubt in my mind that free people are friendlier than oppressed people. Um, now, they are struggling to find meaning. And this is where we, we started the conversation by saying it takes effort. Life takes effort. Life takes focus. Life, ta life takes uh, real energy. And it, under communism, it didn't in a sense. You were told what to do. You were told where to go, where to show up, what, how to live. Uh, you were told what's possible to you and what's not possible to you. Everything was dictated to you. So mentally, it was a, it was a lazy person's paradise, right? You didn't have to think for yourself. That's great. Right. Uh, but there's joy in thinking for yourself. There's the, the whole idea of finding meaning. What's more meaningful than thinking for yourself? What's more meaningful than a life of thought, than a life of effort, than a life of pursuing your own values? And people are looking for some external meaning out there to come hit them over the head. Again, a remnant of Christianity. Uh, I think Europe is dominated by Christianity, even though it's rejected it, right? Mm. There's this idea of the meaning is out there somewhere. I have to go find it. No, the meaning is inside of you. The meaning is the, the, the choices you make about life. Meaning is about the kind of path of life you choose for yourself. Meaning is an independent, thoughtful life of reason. That is what meaning is. But that requires thought, that requires effort, and that requires risk-taking because it's about you and there's no safety net in terms of thinking. Um, and, and, and that requires a certain independence. And unfortunately, because they grew up under communism, they were not trained to be independent thinkers. They were not trained to find meaning in their own lives. They were trained to look to the state, to look to others, to look to, to, to authority for meaning, for, 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 for uh, ideas. Uh, so, so in that sense, they're lost. Hopefully, the generation that's been bought, you know, born under freedom uh, has more of a chance to be successful than, than the people born under communism. But yeah, it's completely, it's completely delusional. Hmm. Interesting. They I live, in a, they live in a fantasy world. <laughs> But it's probably right because uh, so much stuff was done for you. So you But that doesn't lead to happiness. That leads to dread and that leads to boring and that leads to that leads to meaningless lives, not meaningful lives. Meaningless to have a meaningful life you need to exert effort. To have a meaningful life you have to actually pursue values. When, you're, when you don't pursue values, when things are just given to you, your life becomes meaningless, it's boring, it's dull, and it's ugly. And But people forget the ugliness. People forget that they become nostalgic because the stress of the moment leads them to think that something was idyllic in the past. It was not. Hmm. The last question or uh, the comment that I want to add, um, what will be your message for the people who are now uh, 
being refugees from the Ukraine, I believe that many of them will become entrepreneurs. What kind of message would you encourage them with? Yeah, I mean, I think the main message is to to take their life seriously and to to make something of their lives. In a sense, they have an opportunity. Uh, they've been welcomed into countries that tend to be free countries, relatively speaking. Uh, they they because they are being welcomed by by these countries, they have many opportunities. Uh, they have many opportunities to take control of their lives, to become entrepreneurs, to build something, to make something uh, in a peaceful environment. Some of them will go back to Ukraine. Some of them will never go back to Ukraine. They'll stay uh, in these countries. But this is an opportunity to rebuild your life. It will, not only will be an opportunity for Ukraine once it wins to rebuild the country, but now for every Ukrainian has an opportunity to rebuild their life, to reimagine their life, and to take responsibility for it and to really make the most of it. At the end of the day, life is for living. I like to say with a capital L, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, every moment of your life is a moment you will not get back. Uh, you, 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 there's no second chance at life. Uh, you've got to embrace it. You've got to take it seriously. You've got to use your mind to figure out the best way to live. You've got to choose your own values and go for them. Um, and, and maybe the war is a wake-up call that life is short, uh, it's precious, and you've got to embrace it and you've got to be passionate about it and you've got to make the most of it. Thank you very much, Sharon Brooke, for being in our show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you.